He perhaps needs no introduction, but I will anyway. Dr. Patrick Joseph um, has been our resident expert. Um, he is a expert nationally known for infectious diseases, and he has given a series of really thoughtful uh, talks to us about the disease. And so, Dr. Joseph, I understand you want to share um, perhaps another slideshow with us this morning. Yeah, well, I do. And thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the introduction. And, and thank you, everyone, for the participation. I, I learned so much, particularly from Supervisor Anderson and this morning from Senator Glazer. Uh, just a, a lot there, and I share your thoughts completely. I'm going to try to share the screen. Um, so I, uh, with your permission, I, a little bit of a potpourri from the medicine science side. And again, the same title slide. Uh, living with COVID in 2020, because that's what we must do. We have to live with this virus and learn how to live with this virus. Uh, it's pretty clear now that this is not quickly going away. I picked these uh, this uh, six things that we'll touch on briefly in the next few minutes, what I've titled COVID fatigue, perhaps an overview from my perspective of what we are seeing now and why, uh, the mortality rate that is being discussed uh, and, and sometimes confusing the way it's being discussed. And I hope to put a little bit of, of my thoughts behind that. Some of the comments we're hearing about face coverings, staying healthy, a, a note about smelly hand sanitizer because it's one of the more common questions that I'm getting now. So that will be a bit of a chemistry lesson. And then some new stuff about wastewater and how that may guide us uh, in the future. So first, COVID fatigue. We are all getting tired. Uh, on this slide are just some highlights. Uh, we've been living with this now for six months. Uh, it was getting out of control quickly in other places. And in our area, we quickly understood that a stay at home order that was invoked on March 16 was, was one thing we wanted to do. And it was fantastic. It really, really worked. But that's four months ago. And I will put myself in the shoes of everyone in our community and in the country. We wanted this to go away. We didn't sign up for this to be a part of our everyday life. But it is. This virus is relentless. It is not slowing down. If we don't take rudimentary measures to prevent spread, it will increase. And we don't have a lot of opportunity to reduce spread. The stay at home order and then the face coverings that came in on April 17th remain our number one and number two way of controlling this virus. And when I talk about fatigue, it's very clear from walking down the street or from watching the news that we just got tired of doing this. We, we want to go out. We want to socialize. We want to go to retail. We want to go to parties. And look at what's happening in colleges and kids who, who, who want to date. And they've had enough. And the result of having enough is this surge that we are seeing, particularly in the 21 to 40 age group. But this is not something that is uh, analogous to a C with repeated waves. It's much more analogous to a fire, a wildfire, that if you relax your efforts at controlling the wildfire, it will spread. A, wired, a wildfire is relentless. This virus is relentless. And when I see people, and I see fewer of them than we might see in other parts of the country, not taking appropriate precautions, not socially distancing, not wearing a mask correctly. It's easy to understand what's going on. And I'm sure you saw the news last night that there were 40 some cases from uh, fraternity and sorority parties in Berkeley. I believe this is understandable, but not acceptable. It's time that we emphasize that this is all we have. I, I don't wanna say that science has failed us. Science hasn't, we don't have a cure. We don't have a protection. We don't have a vaccine. All we have is social distancing and masking. And that still works. And we have to emphasize that we go, go back to doing that and paying much more attention to being meticulous. 
So I put these numbers together last night, and the numbers on here are, are a seven-day rolling average. And I just wanted to show where we are compared to what's hitting the top of the news. And, and so the new cases per day, as was mentioned, there's about 60,000 new cases a day in the United States. Arizona, Florida, and Texas, and now California are being listed as the top 10. But I wanted to show how much better we are than those other areas where the fatigue factor has become greater. And that's in the right column. That is the new cases per population. That is the new cases per 1 million residents. And you can see that Arizona, Florida, and Texas are in trouble, but we're really doing well in California. So we we're, we're better than some parts of the country at maintaining what we need to do to protect it. We haven't relaxed, and, and as you probably know, and this is not a criticism, some of those states that are showing uncontrolled activity were the first to open bars, the first to open beaches, the first to have parties, the first to have rallies. In California, because of, of our political structure, was very hesitant to do such a thing, and we are reaping the benefits. And then if we take a look at our county, you can see that we are even better than the state. And, and Senator Glazer mentioned this. Southern part of the state is having problems. There are pockets, including incarceration areas that are having problems. But our local community, we are really doing well. And we can do better. So I, I guess the message here is sometimes when things are out of control, it's easy to give up. But when you have control, it's easy to ramp up. And I really encourage all of us to ramp up. And that is go back to wearing masks. Be meticulous about social distancing. It works. The thousands and thousands of, of lives that have been saved, of disease that has been prevented by these simple measures is irrefutable. I want to talk a little bit about mortality because sometimes the news uh, gives a message that is a little bit confusing. We know that although we're having more cases than ever, that more cases than ever, that our mortality rate is lower than ever. But it's a little bit skewed. Supervisor Anderson mentioned that not only in our local area, but nationally, the new cases are in the age group of 21 to 40. So that's where all the cases are occurring. And their mortality rate is very low. And their mortality rate is not going down. It's the same. Similarly, the mortality rate of a 70-year-old or an 80-year-old who gets this disease is not going down. It's the same. So quoting a decrease in the mortality rate is really quoting the age group of the new cases. And this is really important because I think this represents a lag effect. That is, if we have tens of thousands of new cases in the age group of 21 to 40, and, and fortunately the low hospitalization rate and a low mortality rate, it is going to spread to parents, to grandparents, to neighbors, to individuals at, at where protective activity is not being maintained. I fear that if we don't start going back to what we know works, that our next surge is going to be on the right side of that slide. The younger people are going to get it and inadvertently, that is without symptoms, spread it to parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles and neighbors. And the mortality rate again, of those above 60, of those above 70, is not changing. We are not seeing a decrease in a mortality rate by age group but rather a decrease overall, which I think is a little bit uh, skewed the way it's sometimes presented. Now, now let me put in a plug here. We know we're seeing a lot of cases. We know we don't have good medicine, a good antiviral medicine yet. But what this represents may be an opportunity 
for thousands of people to donate plasma. And, and I've said this here before, and, and maybe some of you already know it, but one of our most effective therapeutics for individuals who are in an intensive care unit, for individuals who are on a ventilator, is convalescent plasma. This is plasma that is donated by someone who has had the infection and recovered. They can go to the Red Cross. You can even donate plasma two or three times a week. It's not blood donation, it's plasma donation. So if there is a shining light through all of this, maybe if, this, if, if we encourage people, we will re replenish our decreasing stock of convalescent plasma. As, as a community, when you know people who have this virus, if they are otherwise healthy, recommend to them, consider donating plasma, call the Red Cross. This can be an opportunity for all of us and we don't wanna miss this opportunity. So, as I said, what we have left for us now to, to change the shape of this curve, to go back to where we were, is, is adherence to social distancing and face coverings. And that takes me to the next slide. One of the, oh, by the way, I've, I've tagged this, our, our new phrase is antivirus software. So this is the software that you put on your face to protect your, to protect you from shedding viruses to elsewhere. And just a quick note, this works. Just believe me on this. We are looking at over 100 scientific, virologic, microbiologic studies that show that an infected person with or without symptoms, if he or she wears a mask, protects others. As you walk down the street and you see somebody wearing a mask, they're wearing a mask to protect you in case they're shedding the virus and don't yet know it. And similarly, the reason you wear a mask or a face covering is to protect the people around you, to show the people around you that you care because you may be shedding the virus and not know it. So the mask protects people around you. And I bring this slide up because one of the most common questions that I get, since I have had to recommend mask, people wearing masks for hours and hours at a time. So this would be in a retail facility. This would be in one of my laboratories. This would be in a hospital where an individual has to wear a mask all day long because they're face to face with people or because of their other circumstances, per perhaps in a supermarket, perhaps in a CVS, the people who work there. And, and what I'm hearing is, you know, I get so hot wearing these masks. I, I just can't take it. And, and I, I have to, every hour or so, I have to go take a break and, and let the mask off. And, and I understand that and I believe it. And it's a function of what is being worn. So any of us can wear any of these masks on here that are made of fabric for a short period of time. So if we just have, if we're driving to uh, to a, a supermarket, we can put a mask on, go in the supermarket, come back to our car and take it off. They're fine. But for those who have to wear a mask for a prolonged period of time, the one that's in the middle, the typical surgeon's mask is much cooler. It's a specifically designed mask that is very light, and surgeons have been wearing these for a hundred years. They do capture exhaled virus. They do keep surgeons comfortable. They do keep nurses comfortable. And now they are available. Uh, six months ago, they were not available, but they are now widely available through every retail outlet or every online outlet. So I would say that if you're an individual who has to wear a mask for hours on end, and if you're uncomfortable, this represents an option. So that's my comment about face coverings. Doggone it, they really, really work. And every time I read a study or, or participate in a study, they work better. So these are very good. So next, staying healthy. These numbers are extremely important. So I'm gonna leave them on and, and talk about these a little bit. This is what has happened in the past several months while we were do, uh, participating in shelter in place, when doctor's offices were closed, 
when emergency rooms were, were overwhelmed, that individuals were not participating in routine medical visits. And that's understandable, but this is the effect of that. So I've only put four things up here, breast cancer, prostate cancer, endocervical cancer, and childhood vaccines. This is what has happened in April, in May, and this is our county, that the diagnoses of new cases of breast cancer has dropped by 63% in April, and you can see the numbers for May. In prostate cancer, the number of new cases of prostate cancer has gone down. Endocervical cancer from pap smears and childhood vaccines. These are all one of the unfortunate effects of this COVID pandemic that we are in. And it's understandable, but, but the concept here is all four of these are elective. So remember, breast cancer is almost always diagnosed by routine mammograms, prostate cancer in individuals by physical examination or symptoms, endocervical cancer by pap smears, and of course, childhood vaccines are by routine visits. And what I've put in white across the bottom is although we don't have these, these data in Contra Costa County, in larger areas, there has been an increase during the pandemic of heart attacks and respiratory deaths because individuals did not go to an emergency room. It's time for this to change. It's safe. This concept now can end. Emergency rooms and all doctor's offices have learned so much in the past five to six months that they are safe places. Go back to your doctor get the routine mammograms. It will look different. You will likely be screened when you walk into the waiting room. You will likely be wearing a mask. You will see the entire staff doing things that they have never done before. If you have chest pain or if you have a medical emergency, go to the emergency room. I promise you, you'll be impressed. The guidelines that have been developed for protecting you at a doctor's office, at an urgent care center, at an emergency room are unbelievable. They are overwhelmingly meticulous. And as evidence of that, although many, many healthcare workers, doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists have acquired COVID, they have not acquired it on the job. They are just general population like all of us. So the, the, the protective measures that are being done in hospitals is not putting our healthcare workers at risk for getting infected. And it does not put you at risk. We don't want to see these numbers continue. Remember, all of these, breast cancer, prostate, cervical cancer, the, the outcome of all of these diseases is based on the earliest of the timing of the diagnosis. So if you're overdue for your mammogram or if it had to be postponed, make that appointment. And I promise you, you'll be impressed. It will be like, wow, they really are concerned here. And the same with all of the things on there. And, and if you have been afraid of taking your, your kids to the pediatrician or to their caregiver for a childhood vaccine, it's time to re-up them. Childhood vaccines save tens of thousands of lives each year. And now for a chemistry lesson. Hand sanitizers. Well, hand sanitizers have become uh, sort of a, a, uh, a public uh, knowledge-based uh, product that is everywhere. So let's talk a little bit about this. There are three alcohols that are widely available, methyl alcohol, ethyl alcohol, and isopropyl alcohol. First, let's talk about methyl alcohol. Methyl alcohol is wood alcohol based on how it was originally produced, and it is bad. To my knowledge, there are no methyl alcohol hand sanitizers manufactured in the United States, but they are sold. They are manufactured in other countries. Do not use them. Methyl alcohol 
is a chemical that is to be used in industry. It is not to be used in a hand sanitizer. And, and like I said, I don't think it's made in the United States. It can be absorbed through the skin. It is extremely toxic. So look, particularly if you see a hand sanitizer coming from uh, a different country, look at it and see if the word methyl alcohol is there or wood alcohol and throw it away quickly because it will be absorbed through your skin. Now the other two are ethyl alcohol and isopropyl alcohol and, and what a story of Purell, right? Uh, 1988, there was this idea that we wanna be able to clean our hands without water. And although the history of the waterless alcohol-based hand sanitizers uh, is in controversy, Purell was certainly one of the first on the market and, and became a brand name like so many other things. And it is 70% ethyl alcohol. Equally as effective is isopropyl alcohol. And there are many out there that are 70 to 75% isopropyl alcohol. They are both fine, they both work, no, no preference of one over the other for a long time, nothing was available, and now everything is, these are both good. Now what happened during the time that there was such a shortage of hand sanitizers, we had distilleries and wineries saying, hey, you, you know what, we make ethyl alcohol, that's how we produce our product for drinking. So we will remanufacture our distilleries or remanufacture our wineries and, and we'll make ethyl alcohol and you can add some propylene glycol and some aloe and, and some, some lanolin and, and we will step up to the plate and help the country and provide hand sanitizers and, and several of them did that, and they made ethyl alcohol. Most of them are 80% because they can, they can make alcohol as strong as they want to because they're using these huge distilleries that previously were made for whiskey or for wine or for, for other drinking alcohols. Now, now, and ethyl alcohol is the drinking alcohol. Uh, isopropyl alcohol is not isopropyl alcohol, is rubbing alcohol. But, but here's the difference. I, I get these calls like, my hand sanitizer stinks. Every time I, I use it on my hands, my hands smell like garbage or my hands smell like sewage. So Purell and isopropyl alcohol, the alcohol is made by a chemical reaction in a laboratory using pure products. So it's a chemical reaction. The ethyl alcohol that comes from the wineries and the distilleries comes from fermentation of whatever product they use. So if it's wine, it's fermentation of grapes. If it's whiskey, it's fermentation of corn, barley, hops, wheat. And that fermentation creates some smelly chemicals that go with the alcohol. Now that's a good thing if you're drinking it, but it's not a good thing if, if it's opened up uh, well, wine does not necessarily smell good in, a, in a, an open glass of wine on your counter for a couple of weeks. It starts to get a, a pretty ugly smell. So what we're, what we're seeing is these hand sanitizers that were made by distilleries and wineries have a little bit of an ugly smell. Now the smell is just an amine. The smell is not a germ. It's not infected. And it doesn't do anything except make your hands smell, but it's very safe and still gets rid of virus. So if this is all one can get, it still works. It's excellent. It replaces hand washing, but it does have a little bit of an odor. And I'm told that there are a few companies out there that are making a product where a couple drops can be added to these, these fermentation-based hand sanitizers that will take care of the smell. And then the last topic, wastewater testing. Who would have thought? This actually is a picture of the wastewater plant in Oakland, California. So a little bit of a background. The coronavirus and all respiratory viruses are excreted in stool. They're not alive but they are excreted in stool. They're viral particles or pieces of the, the RNA or the nucleic acid. It's all chewed up and it's all broken up, 
but the genes or the sequences of the nucleic acid are intact, which means that you can detect COVID-19 or coronavirus in wastewater, in sewage water. Well, as it turns out, we know we have difficulties with testing. Let's talk a little bit about the PCR testing that all of us are, are used to. We're recommending it for everybody, but many people can't get it. Many people don't want to wait. If you saw the lines that in Arizona waiting overnight to get tested. We also know that some people who want to get tested just, or who need to be tested, won't do it. And we're, use, we're creating these percentages uh, that, that Supervisor Anderson mentioned yesterday of the percentage positive of those who elect to get tested. And we want better numbers, but we still, testing is not a mandate, nor should it ever be, but we're left to what is the percentage positives of those individuals who want to be tested. Wastewater is a little bit different. In, in three distinct studies now, Sampling the coronavirus from wastewater at sewage plants can tell us how much coronavirus is in the capture area, that is in the community that is served by a wastewater plant. And it is almost always, it, it, can, be, it can be enumerated. In other words, from the amount in the wastewater, using a formula can be predicted how many persons are infected. And these will be persons who are actively infected or at least recovering from infection within the first month. And this represents a potentially fantastic number to tell us what's going on in the community. And then in three different communities, sampling wastewater for the coronavirus has predicted a spike meaning that it shows up in the wastewater first before it shows up in the number of sick people. And, and that probably is because we're still dealing with a third uh, to maybe 40, 45% of the, of the people, of the persons who are sick have no symptoms. And again, this is a function of the younger people. But if we assume that 40% that of those who are infected have no symptoms, they're not gonna get tested, but it is gonna show show up in the wastewater. So just a message here that we don't have control of this virus. I, I, I'm not going to embellish it. I'm not going to exaggerate it. I'm not going to downplay it. But I, I will promise you that the field of science and the field of medicine is not slowing down. We are working on absolutely everything we can to help us control this virus. And this is yet one new concept that I think I'm not discussed here, but it looks very exciting. And so, Mr. Mayor and all of you, thank you very much again. I will stop with that and we can move forward. Dr. Joseph, thank you. That was really quite interesting. Uh, a, a question for Dr. Joseph. Um, uh, somebody writes in that their company has read multiple science-based articles about the aerosol airborne transmission of COVID, uh, but information is, uh, is very clear about wearing a mask. But when it comes to air within a building with recycled air with no ability to open windows, um, they, they write, can you please clear the air, and they do say pun intended, uh, on safe measures that we can take within the office in that kind of environment? Uh, I'll try. The, uh, so th there, was a, there was a, going back six months, there was a disagreement between the United States Public Health Service and the World Health Organization on the infectivity of this virus in the air. And the United States Public Health Service became extremely conservative and said that th this virus should be considered infectious up to about six feet from a, uh, from a person who is tr who's transmitting the virus. The World Health Organization uh, was uh, a little bit different and they were using a three foot and there are terms for that. As more and more of these studies come out, it would appear that the United States was spot on, that this virus can be spread up to six feet away. After about six feet, two things happen with this virus. It falls to the ground because it is, it does have mass. And secondly, it dries. 
This virus is extremely susceptible to drying. It's not one of these viruses that, that will live on a dry surface very long. So that's the purpose of the six feet. The mask uh, with that is even more effective because it captures about 90% of the virus that is exhaled from a person who is shedding. So of those 10% that get through, they fall off at about six feet. And I'm now talking about indoor air, okay? That's all that needs to be considered. Recirculated air is not a problem. Recirculated air kills a virus instantly from drying. So you don't see recirculated air being a problem. And this was studied pretty heavily on the cruise ships where we had these large conglomerates of infections of people on a cruise ship. And it turned out it was not from the air recirculation, but it was rather face-to-face -face contact or contact within six feet. So I, at least the information today, I always say that, the information today <laughs> is that you're very safe in a building on the indoors if you use social distancing and wear a mask and recirculation is currently thought not to be a problem. Great. Uh, another question for Dr. Joseph. Um, somebody writes in that they read that uh, e even if you have the antibodies, you can still carry COVID. Uh, would that be the, the same case if you're vaccinated eventually? Uh, once you're vaccinated, will you still be able to carry COVID? Uh, well, well, let's defer the vaccine question because we really don't know how the vaccine is going to work. Uh, typically, once a person is vaccinated for measles, mumps, rubella, you, you never carry it. And we hope it goes that way with COVID. This sometimes can be difficult to describe in words, but, but let me see what I can do with this. When you're first infected, the test is positive and you're shedding live virus and you're infectious. That's, that's during the first 10 days. So if I were infected today, and I got symptoms in four days, my test would be positive and I would be spreading infectious virus. After 10 days, it's common for my test to still be positive, but I'm not infectious. What we're testing after about 10 days is viral particles that are not contagious, but I would continue to carry them. My body is killing them from antibodies so that they don't infect other people. So once the antibody turns positive, which is about seven to 10 days, the nose test, the PCR test can still be positive, but a person is not infectious, so much so that we permit them to come back to work. So the antibody is a good test when it's used at the right time to help us identify that people can go back to work, back into society, and we even let them come back into the hospital to work as care providers. I know that's confusing, but I hope it helps. First week, PCR test means you're infectious. After the, the, the second week, the PCR test may be positive, but you're not infectious. Here's one that uh, I haven't heard before, but um, uh, are ozone generators effective in cleaning masks? Well, so the, the cleaning the mask concept is, uh, is, is very muddy. First of all, it's, we have to start off by, is it even necessary? Uh, ozone does kill viruses. So if one has an ozone generator and you use it correctly on a mask that is not destroyed by the ozone, that's, that's O3, uh, which, which is, is a little bit of a, of a toxic molecule, it will kill the virus. Uh, if it's a cloth mask, uh, works very well in a washing machine as well, or just rinsing it out with soap and water. Uh, so the answer is yes, but very little practical use.